It's a great honor to be here. Thank you so much. This is my first time at DLD. Um, I probably have the best job in the world. Um, every year, I get to invite my heroes and my peers and some young journalists and send them out around the world on these crazy um, projects. We used to do a series of books looking at what the world was like in the course of a day. I'm just going to start with, if we could go up to the slides, uh, we'll start the first image. Hi, Joe. We're starting the first one. So, um, as I said, I've been sending photographers around the world on these, journalists, on these journeys for a couple of years, and I came up with the idea of having 100 photographers look at a topic several years ago and got turned down by every publisher in the world that told me what a stupid idea it was. So I had to find another way of, of actually organizing these projects. We started looking at a country on a day, on your market said go, you've got 24 hours, the best photographers in the world let loose. As I said, this was turned down by every publisher in the world. And it became the most successful photography series uh, in publishing history. I started thinking, instead of just doing a day in a country, it would be interesting if you could take the same journalists and task them with looking at emerging topics. So we looked at the, uh, the global water crisis, how the internet was first affecting the world in 1993. Um, and this last year, we've been looking at a really interesting topic, this idea of big data. I'm gonna sort of walk you through my journey over the last year. One of the things that never occurred to me is when you invite journalists representing the media, they go back to their editors and their publications, and suddenly we thought we'd be lucky to get a review inside these magazines, but instead we ended up on the cover of magazines around the world, and the media sort of have fallen in love with these products because it's sort of, it's a real world, real time snapshot. So um, this is the died and gone to heaven moment in publishing. I found my next favorite thing one day when I was just going through the bookstore. One of my favorite things to do is to go to the bookstore. That's about as, as good as it gets in publishing. There's no, nothing better than that. So. Um, Last year, I was at, um, at uh, the TED conference, and I ran into Marissa uh, Meyer and her husband, Zach, and we started talking, and they said, what's your next project? I said, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out what we should sort of tackle next. And they said, have you thought about doing big data? And I said, what's big data? And um, what, was, what I heard coming from Marissa and Zach was that the world is developing a nervous system that all of a sudden, all over the world, for the first time in human history, we have the ability to measure things and look at the world in a way that's never been possible before. And one of the things Marissa did is she sort of pointed me to this really interesting quote from Eric Schmidt. The idea that the, all of the data created by the human race is five exabytes, whatever that is, because I'm not a data scientist, I'm a journalist, and that now every two days, we're generating the same amount of data. It's a straight vertical line. The second thing that I heard as I started learning about this whole new world of big data, and I'll push my button here, is, um, that we're actually starting to measure everything on Earth. I think we all tend to think of computers and our laptops and our cell phones as the things that are generating data, but as you're gonna see in a minute, it, the entire planet, every object on the planet is now starting to generate data, and it is really like watching the, the planet develop a nervous system. The way the story was being told, primarily by the media until about six months ago, was that whenever you heard big data, you immediately heard it followed by Big Brother. And there's certainly a lot of things we need to worry about, and it's not, it, we haven't ignored this in this project, but I think for the most part, it's, it's actually a very positive story. My son is 10 years old. He always hears me on the phone interviewing people about data. And he said, Dad, you keep saying big data over and over and over again on the phone. What does that mean? And I was thinking, how do you explain this to a 10-year-old? And I said, Jesse, imagine if the whole of humanity had been looking through one eye since the dawn of humanity. All of a sudden, scientists allowed us to open up a second eye. So what you're getting is not just more information, but you're getting a different dimension. So of course, being 10 years old, he said, Dad, could scientists let us open up a third eye and a fourth and a thousand eyes? And if you're 10 years old, a thousand eyes is really cool. I said, that's exactly what we're doing. So let me get, show you some examples of it, because some of these things are pretty fascinating. Um, we decided to look at all these different topics of human endeavor all over the, all over the planet. So we had 100 journalists around the world, took about six months, probably the most challenging project we've ever worked on. And um, I'll show you some of the stories. So the average person today in a city like Munich is exposed to more information in the course of a day than somebody in the 15th century was exposed to in their entire lifetime. And that during a baby's first day of life, 70 times the amount of information um, generated, is generated by the, the Library of Congress in that first day of a baby's life today. And if any of you have, any of you have teenagers here, if you have a teenager, so you know on your iPhone it's got find my phone, well, they actually have a gadget now which is basically find my teenager. 
Uh, progressive auto insurance is a little gadget they'll put inside your car and they'll lower your insurance rates if you allow them to know when you drive, where you drive, how fast you drive, what time of day, what part of town. So there's always this trade-off for information and privacy. And then finally, what we've seen is the amplification of open data through Twitter and Facebook has had an enormous effect on politics. So let me give you some of the examples. Some of the things I found were particularly fascinating as we sort of learned about this whole topic. When the earthquake hit in Japan the year before last, obviously it was just a horrible, horrible uh, disaster. One of the stories I heard that was fascinating is that 14 seconds before the earthquake hit, before it hit, every factory and every bullet train in Japan came to a stop. They have spent half a billion dollars in Japan installing an early earthquake warning system that sensed the earthquake. And imagine if the trains and the factories had been running when that earthquake hit. But what I found was even more interesting is a group of entrepreneurs in Palo Alto, California, created a, a program called Quake Catcher. So using the, the accelerometer in your laptop, if my laptop is about to fall off the table, it would know it's falling. So these entrepreneurs figured out the same accelerometer could be used by hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. So when people go to bed at night, they fire up Quake Catcher. There's no money involved. People are just doing it to help each other. And I love this idea that you have a half a billion dollar hardwired dedicated system, took 15 years to install, and a free ubiquitous system that people are installing on their computers at night just to help each other. I love this picture. My kids love this picture. Um, the South Pacific, they're putting sensing devices on, an, on animals like this elephant seal that collect data about water patterns, migration, topography, and whenever it gets close to one of those transponders, it does a data dump which goes up to the surf, surface and up to a satellite. Really cool, using uh, animals to help map the planet. Imagine if you got your American Express or Visa card tomorrow and there's no itemization. Would any of us ever pay a bill like that? Obviously not. And yet every month we get an electrical bill and we have the faintest idea what it is we're paying for. So Sweetak Patel is a 29-year-old MacArthur fellow. He started three companies. He wrote a little, he created a little chip and wrote an algorithm that actually analyzes, he can see the digital signature of every appliance in your house. And he can actually tell you what every single appliance in your house is costing you on a monthly basis. That's interesting. But I said, is there something that you learned that the average person would be surprised by? And he said the average American spends 11% of their monthly bill on the DVR on that little box underneath your television set that's spinning all the time whether or not you're recording on it. So instead of building a new nuclear power plant or digging another oil well, maybe just redesigning the DVR would be an interesting way to address some of the energy problems. A lot of these stories are, are just fascinating. Um, a group of scientists looked at all the crime data for the city of New York. Instead of looking at where the crimes were committed, they said, what other data is available that no one's looking at? And they actually looked at the home addresses of where the criminals lived before they went to jail. You think, okay, another neighborhood I want to avoid, right? Well, they said, well, maybe since we know where many criminals are coming from, maybe this would be a good place to go in and put early childhood intervention or career counseling or drug counseling or something to use the information we have to actually address the problem in a new and, and sort of creative way. Up to half the drugs in Africa are counterfeit. You go to a pharmacy, you want to buy antibiotics, you basically flip a coin. You have a 50% chance that what you're buying, even though it looks like it's packaged in the same bottles you get anywhere else in the world, is counterfeit. So um, a gentleman uh, named Bright Simons came up with a really clever idea. He puts a unique uh, SMS code on the side of every bottle of medicine, and while you're at the pharmacy, before you pay for it, you text it for free, and it tells you right there on the spot if that's actually penicillin or antibiotics. It's a very interesting, low-cost solution to an incredibly um, important problem. This is one of the stories I really love. For years, radar operators around airports have been complaining about the fact that they keep having to filter out the birds and the bees and the bats and the insects because they're trying to find the airplanes. And a group of scientists said, wait, you've got 15 years of bat migration and you've been throwing it away? Are you crazy? So what I love is that to one, what one person is garbage is somebody else's complete gold. And you're finding this in industry after industry as people are actually sharing and merging the data. They're finding patterns that nobody would have ever suspected before. The Gates Foundation is working on an absolutely fascinating program with the Esri. Uh, with, with Esri. Esri does really high quality maps of the world. Esri discovered there were villages in uh, Nigeria that didn't exist on any known maps. The Gates Foundation is working to eradicate polio in Nigeria. So by finding villages that no one knew were there, the Gates Foundation gave out tens of thousands of GPS-enabled cell phones, and now they can see in real time where the inoculation workers are going. So I just love this idea of this triangulation of using satellites to cure uh, diseases like polio. Um, 
when uh, Steve Jobs got ill a couple of years ago, um, it cost $100,000 to sequence his DNA, to try to find out the exact specific disease he had and what, he, what might actually help keep him alive. Today it costs $4,000. Francis Collins, who's the head of the National Institute for Health, at TED Med last year talked about the fact that he thinks five to 10 years from now, before any doctor is able to prescribe any drug, that you will have your DNA sequence for $40. It'd be like going to your pharmacy. It's like getting a flu shot. The reason for this is apparently pharmaceutical companies all over the world are working on really important cures for human disease. And when they get into clinical trials, they find that a tiny number of people are adversely affected. So it might cure 99% of the people, but it would kill 1%. Obviously, they can't ever release that. What the hope is that by sequencing each of our individual DNA, we'll be able to figure out that, you know, that Joe Schoendorf would be cured by this disease and I would, by this treatment, I would be cured by it. And what's wonderful about it is that all these drugs and these uh, cures are sitting there on the shelves and can be dusted off and hopefully be brought back to life. Um, I'm gonna go quickly here because I'm, I'm going pretty quick. Um, a lot of you, any of you, you know, we all got the Nike fuel band, uh, Esther. Uh, is, with, is, is wearing hers, and I know Esther's a big fan of Fitbit, and I'm wearing the up band. Um, my mother's 90 years old, and my mother, uh, my dad passed away five years ago, and about three years after he died, she started falling. She insisted on living at home, in the home where my parents lived. And the third time she fell, they didn't find her for five hours, so my brother and sister and I said, Mom, you know, we, we can't let you live at home anymore because it's just too dangerous. And she said, no, damn it, I'm staying in my house. You're not getting me out of my house. So. We hired these women to live with her in shifts, in 24-hour shifts, which she hated. You know, they're stealing my garbage bags. It's like, they're not stealing your garbage bags, mom. Anyway, um, little aside, um, I found out that uh, General Electric and Intel are working on a series of products, one of which is called the Magic Carpet. You install this carpet in the home of your loved one, and it doesn't say good or bad, it just says, Rick's mom wakes up at 9.30 in the morning on an average day. This is how fast she walks, this is her balance. And on a day where suddenly the carpet senses that the pattern's off, it's 11 o'clock in the morning and my mother hasn't touched the carpet. It, it actually, they believe they'll be able to predict two days before somebody falls, that they're going to fall. This product's not out yet. Well, Dean and Ornish and I have had a bunch of conversations about the fact that if you start wearing these devices and measure yourself all the time, three years before you're in an ambulance on the way to the hospital, your body's been giving off all kinds of data, but we've been ignoring it. We aren't measuring it. We're not watching. So right now, we're spending 18% of America's GDP on healthcare. Maybe if we have an early warning system in the form of these devices, that we'll be able to use this data to actually fix the problem while there's still time to actually address it. This is pizza delivery on a Friday night in New York City. This is Domino's Pizza. They put GPS devices on bicycle messengers. It's just delightful. I mean, some of the, some of the data stuff is just pure fun. I'm gonna keep going quickly here. So um, imagine this gentleman has a wireless pacemaker. So throughout the day, his pacemaker transmits his data to his doctor. And he called them one day and he said, you know, I've been tra tracing my uh, exercise, my alcohol, my sleep, and I want to correlate it against when my pacemaker kicks in. Could I have six months of the last six months of data that you've been collecting about my heart? And they said, sorry, sir, this is our proprietary data. And he said, wait, wait a second, this is my heart. You've been collecting information about my heart. They won't give it to him. So it kind of, it's an interesting story about him in particular, but it sort of poses the bigger question. Why is it that we're generating all this data through our credit cards, through our Fitbits, through our credit, uh, browser histories, and everybody else is making money off of it except us and controlling it. We seem to have very little say over it. One of the points of doing this project is not to say big data is going to cure all of our problems. It's to say we need to be talking about this now. These are governments and corporations for the most part that are thinking about big data. I think the average person should be talking and thinking about it too. Nigel Holmes is one of the world's leading infographic designers to these wonderful, wonderful infographics looking at these different sort of areas of big data. EMC is the company that funded this whole project. They had no editorial input or control. They gave us complete freedom as a group of journalists to simply to get people talking about this project. One of the things I'm the most excited about is that I went to FedEx and I asked them if they would help me give this book away for free on one day. So we actually delivered this to 10,000 world leaders Fortune 500 CEOs, heads of media companies, Olympic athletes, Oscar winners. I'm just trying to get people thinking and talking about this. I have two other things I want to show you very quickly. Um, we thought that to try to get people thinking about data and how it helps you understand how you compare. I think all of us are really curious about each other. So we did two things. We created a really cool smartphone app. It's not up anymore, but for three months we asked people to measure and compare themselves to each other. 
Join millions of people around the globe to measure our world using your smartphone. You can share and compare. Map your daily footprint. Share what brings you luck. Get a glimpse into the one thing people want to experience during their lifetime and discover hidden secrets about the world you live in. Curious what your phone can tell you about your life? Compare answers with millions of others globally. Find your data doppelganger, someone just like you, somewhere else in the world. We'll donate $1 per download to Charity Water for the first 50,000 downloads as a way to say thank you for participating in the human face of big data. Charity Water uses 100% of public donations to directly fund clean water projects. Participate in one of the largest collaborative events in history and help measure our world. Check out thehumanfaceofbigdata.com to learn more. So imagine if 2013 is exactly where the internet was in 1993. When I first started on this project, I was hearing about big data from a lot of people, and at first I was pretty skeptical. I thought it's a marketing term. It's a better way to sell me sweaters. I mean, it, it just it sounded like one of those sort of amorphic things you hear people dropping in conversation. But after having now spent the last 18 months focused on listening and learning and asking people like DJ Patil and Aaron Koblen and some incredibly smart people who have taken incredible time to teach me and educate me and share their ideas, I'm utterly convinced this is going to have a thousand times bigger effect in our lives going forward. This is going to be a year that the human race looks back on, and this is going to be an enormous turning point. Um, right now, I'm working with Cisco to do an hour TV documentary about it, and the last thing I want to show you is because I have a 10 and 12 year old, I was thinking about how to get them excited about this right now. So we did a project called Data Detectives. And we worked together with the TED organization. They had a TED youth uh, project which took place recently. And I love the idea that the average teenager, teenager around the world now is basically carrying a broadcast network in their pocket. I mean, just think about this. When we were all growing up, when you were 16 years old, the fact that you could share and compare your life in real time with other kids is fascinating. So we did a couple of things. We asked them some very thought-provoking questions. Um, this website is actually still up for, ki for kids to use. And we asked them things like, if you never needed to sleep, would you do that? You know, how, do you dare, how did Chinese parents discipline their kids versus kids in Argentina or, or kids in Munich? And um, we actually gave examples of how kids around the world are already using data in really interesting ways to learn about the world. It's my son Jesse taking a pill he shouldn't be taking that travels through his body and transmits the data. Um, and then finally, um, we asked the kids, if you could do one thing in the world, in your life, one thing in your life, during your lifetime, what would it be? And I thought I would just leave you with this. Some of these are funny, some are touching, some are heartbreaking. These are kids in about 50 different countries now that have answered these questions so far. And what's fun is you can, the, we can go in and say, how old were the kids? Um, do they have single parents? Um, do, they, do they have other older brothers or sisters? What was their birth order? And being able to take these questions which are interesting in, in and of themselves and then being able to parse them that way, I think is really, really fascinating. I won't tell you which one was my kids. <laughs> There's a wonderful artist at Akamai um, who actually helped, who did this animation. I'm thankful to them for that. The pet dinosaurs was my daughter, sorry, I have to admit. Thank you very much.